hello everyone and welcome to the fifth and final seminar in this series on artificial intelligence curated specifically for committee members of the Law Council of Australia. I'm Susanna Wilkinson, I'm the Regional Head of Emerging Tech at Herbert Smith Freehills and Chair of the Digital Commerce Committee. Over the previous four sessions we've explored how AI works, in particular generative AI, uh, and analysed specific legal issues including IP and privacy. When it comes to these transformational technologies, we need to pay attention to how they're being developed, deployed, used and scaled. This is particularly true of AI if we want to ensure that the future we get is the one that we've actually chosen. Today's session recognises the important role that lawyers and in particular law council committee members can play in shaping policy, law reform and enforcement to build these appropriate guardrails. We are really fortunate today to be hearing insights from our guest speaker, who has been at the forefront of emerging tech policy for many years. Uh, so I'm really happy to introduce uh, Nicholas Davies, he's Industry Professor Emerging Technology at UTS. So together with Professor Edward Santo, who's a former Human Rights Commissioner, Nick co-leads the Human Technology Institute. The HTI is uh, University of Technology of Sydney's new initiative on building Australia's capability on ethical and responsible artificial intelligence. So Nick's background is varied and prestigious. Uh, I will read out all these things because I couldn't remember them, couldn't possibly remember them all, but his areas of expertise include innovation policy, technology and regulation, strategic foresight and multi-stakeholder collaboration processes. From 2015 to 2019, he was head of society and innovation and a member of the executive committee at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, Switzerland responsible for developing the theme of the fourth industrial revolution and overseeing the development of cooperative emerging technology policy efforts around the world. He holds a number of different positions at various tertiary institutions around the world. He's an associate fellow at the University of Oxford Said Business School. He's a visiting professor at UCL's Department of Science, Tech, Engineering and Public Policy. He's a visiting fellow at ANU in the School of Cybernetics an associate fellow at the Geneva Centre for Security Policy and serves on a number of boards and committees. And as if all of that wasn't enough, um, he's a professor of practice at Arizona State University's Thunderbird School of Global Management. He was previously the World Economic Forum Head of Europe uh, and is a director at the Oxford Investment Research and was before that a commercial lawyer. So it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to have Nick with us today. The purpose of this session or the way we're going to run this session is a fairly straightforward kind of Q&A um, and we're going to explore four key themes. Firstly, we're going to start looking at the artificial intelligence ecosystem in Australia and why do we need organisations such as the Human Technology Institute. We then can dive in and explore some concepts around responsible AI, what that really means and how businesses uh, can adopt responsible AI kind of practices. We'll look at the state of AI regulation um, in Australia and perhaps a little global comparison. And then we'll also look to the future to see what the future holds. So uh, we do have Nick's just on his way to his desk. Hopefully he's with us shortly. Are you on audio and video? Hey, look at that. Do you need another 30 seconds or are you all good? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your patience as I, um, as Susanna introduced me and I made my way from the aftermath of a traffic accident here in Canberra that luckily wasn't involving me and into the room with you all. But can you, uh, can you hear me okay, Susanna? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to swap over devices or are you all good? I might swap over devices, but we can get started as I plug everything in. Okay. Um, well, will you, um, while you do that, the, um, I suppose where I'd like to start is just looking at the role of the Human Technology Institute. And just for those on the on the call, the Human Technology Institute builds on the great work uh, that the Australian Human Rights Commission uh, did with the Human Technology Project um, and has now set its own goals and objectives for really important initiatives in the AI space. So can you tell us um, what are the goals of, of the Human Technology Institute and how does it fit into the AI ecosystem in Australia? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks very much for that lovely introduction. And it's great to be here with the Law Council of Australia. 
Um, the Human Technology Institute is a, um, a bit of a weird beast. It's, it's very different from a lot of other research institutes and university institutes in that we actually get points taken away from our uh, KPIs if we publish in academic journals. The, um, the goal for Ed and Sally Cripps and myself, the three co-directors, um, is really to drive an impact um, through direct engagement with policymakers, with organisations um, and with um, other institutions that are building really practical tools in the governance of emerging technologies. All right, so we're focused on the end um, around what we call strategic skills uh, in this space. So um, we do have a data science team and, um, and do some technical skill development, but probably about 90% of our focus is just on what we think of as the minimum viable understanding that um, legal professionals, that um, uh, senior executives, corporate leaders, and that public servants need to be able to make the most of AI systems. Um, we have a, a deep policy um, uh, team and, and project where we're, we're working very closely with um, departments such as um, Home Affairs, with um, uh, Services Australia, with the Department of Customer Service in New South Wales and others um, on a variety of, um, of, of projects really related to how you build trust through legislation and, um, and good design, good procurement, good practices um, around AI in particular. Um, and then the third area is we we are building tools. We're we're building um, data science tools around causal inference, which is a a type of machine learning that allows you to make policy interventions because it's based on causality rather than just pure correlation, which is the which is the basis of most um, uh, AI kind of statistical machine learning techniques. Um, and and we're doing a lot of we're building a lot of frameworks. So uh, a lot of work around AI model assurance and organisational risk management, which which is really key to how um, professionals are able to be consistent in their approach to um, ensuring the, the 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 impacts of AI systems are really in line with those commercial, regulatory, and reputational goals. Um, that are also, you know, um, supported by um, uh, by common law and uh, by statutory duties. Um, so we're about sixteen people, um, nominally based in Sydney, but I'm in I'm based in Canberra, um, and we play very nicely with the other kind of institutes in here that tend to focus more on academic research um, uh, and and publication, um, or who tend to focus on the technical skills in this area. So we're really trying to complement those other two. Um, uh, groups out there in the in the university but applied space um, where we situate ourselves. Fantastic, thank you. That's super comprehensive. Can I, I want to pick up on the risk management piece there. Um, the seminar series that um, that we've had to date has focused probably um, on generative AI more than others, given the hype cycle, um, and the risks and, and harms of generative AI are quite different to some other applications and some other use cases of artificial intelligence. When we talk, and we don't really talk about sort of human rights abuses with, with generative AI, but just to sort of set the scene and give a broader perspective of why these conversations are so important. Can you um, just share a couple of examples of, why, of, of the, the key, the, the big risks with AI, and and we've talked separately about you know the benefits of this rights-based approach to governing the development and deployment of AI, and I think that'll be a really nice counterpoint to some of the content from the previous sessions. Yeah, and, and look, so I think that um, we've been doing a lot of work, uh, and I think really important work on trying to make sense of the design principles that policymakers and senior decision makers are, are are kind of having to bring to bear when they look at at AI. And, and one of the the kind of two of the buzzwords that that comes that are coming out in the regulatory space, um, and, and these are that they're, they're presented as terms of art, but they're quite fuzzy. And one of them is risk based regulation, and the other is rights based regulation. And when you actually look into um, legislative proposals such as the EU's AI Act, um, they're, they're generally a mix of the two. Um, and when you talk about um, risk based regulation, you, you you in the law council as members will probably recognize that, that that does get used used in two different ways um in terms of first the the application of these um of, of regulatory resources to where the greatest risk of breach lies um and then risk based just meaning oh we need to vary the regulatory duties and focus based on the the, the risks to or harms to society that could evolve um 
And I guess where um, Ed and I particularly come back and where HTI situate ourselves is that, that we really do need to underpin um, those kind of design choices about how you vary regulatory resources and how you um, assess risks with this um, basic understanding that um, that it should we should be um, always uh, supporting um, not necessarily you know protecting is not a quite 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 language but ensuring that we don't engage or or undermine um, rights in key areas. And what that means kind of very practically to your question, Susanna, is, um, for instance, we published last year in September a model law for facial recognition in Australia, um, where we took a risk based approach um, by, by virtue of saying, um, I like with as with generative AI, facial recognition is an incredibly flexible set of technologies that can be deployed in, in a myriad, you know, infinite contexts for a whole variety of different purposes. Um, and so to be able to uh, regulate and govern those systems well, you need to bring in an understanding of the, the context in which it operates, the type of technology uh, that is being operated, um, your data governance aspects, um, and also issues such as consent and, uh, and how the effective individual is situated vis-a-vis -vis those technologies. And you do that by virtue of coming back to rights. So you do that by saying people um, in Australia, we can, of course, from the common law as well as from um, uh, state regimes, you can look at um, what those rights are, how they're expressed in the form of um, privacy rights in terms of um, expression or association, um, uh, the rights that are associated with um, engagement with the government and um, uh, procedural fairness and administrative law, and start to think about then um, how to make sure that those, those system assessments um, and, and, the, and the, the regulatory duties, the legal obligations really um, rest first and foremost against um, those rights. And where we are seeing those rights being actively breached um, is it's um, most common is probably in, in surveillance and privacy. So it's just inappropriate data collection. Um, the second area that we see a lot is actually on misleading and unfair conduct. Um, uh, the, the Travago case was a really big um, uh, piece of legislation and precedent in this, uh, not legislation, big, really big. I got stunned by that. <laughs> really big precedent in that, um, in that area. So um, uh, we start to think about this in terms of, um, uh, yeah, misleading. There's also a huge amount of discrimination um, being performed, um, unlawful discrimination, we would argue, by biased mm -hmm. systems um, uh, that are out there um, live in the community. And finally, we, we do see um, uh, that because vulnerable and ma marginalised communities are the least able to know when um, a harm has been perpetrated against them or why. Um, we do see that in the case of state use of um, government use of, of algorithms, um, classic cases are um, government use in um, New South Wales Police Force and, and other areas, um, different forms of AI and algorithmic decision making, which may not rise to the level of machine learning, but nevertheless is more and more being replaced by machine learning type systems, they, they really fundamentally um, are undermining um, are rights with relation to, um, you know, uh, fairness and, and engagement with the state, uh, um, particularly in, in um, uh, criminal justice uh, areas. Um, so th these harms are very real and, they, and, and we very deliberately distinguish in our work between harms and risks where we say harms are irreversible, um, tend to be irreversible, they're real impacts, they're real story on people, stories on people. And we want to use that language in our, in our work, even, especially with the legal profession, um, because there is a tendency here to think of AI-related risks as rather amorphous and distant. And um, it's not the case. Uh, it is possible to identify and, um, and really uh, uh, care for, about those harms today. Yeah, look, that's fascinating because... There is, um, you know, AI is such a broad umbrella term for a vast range of technologies and, um, you know, it really derives its agency from being embedded into the networks of people and things and the different use cases. So I think that's a really helpful, um, you know, approach to thinking about the differences. And, and what I hear from what you're saying there is that actually we have a whole bunch of existing laws that can go some way to protecting against these harms. Um, which is often the case with emerging technology, we have, you know, we, we have a tendency to want to kind of get that one new regulatory reform that will kind of rule them all. But actually, we've got a lot of concepts under our existing bodies of law. And I think that's also what's interesting to different committees within the Law Council. So when we're looking at IP reform or specific areas of law reform, making sure that we don't miss 
the opportunities to bring in um, or to perhaps enforce and think about existing laws in, in through the lens of how these technologies are being deployed. Um, so with that, uh, well, that's kind of, I guess, we're, we're looking at, you know, that's the broad role of, um, of the Human Technology Institute and the, the rationale behind it, which is a really um, an important role. Please, I did mention, hopefully, at the beginning, you know, very happy to take questions throughout this session. So please, if you do have questions, put them in the chat um, and I will do my best to moderate them as we go. Um, but let's now move on to um, concepts of responsible AI. Um, and let me know if you want to switch devices at yeah, any I point just, and I will stop talking. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll come over here, see if you can see me. Yes, sweet. <laughs> There we go. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Hi, no problem. Well done. Seamless. Look at that. Beautiful transition. <laughs> Almost seamless. Almost um, seamless. Yeah. So no, yeah can, I can, just, can, I, to... can I just build on that point you just made, Susanna? Yeah. Um, I hear too, when I talk to, um, when, I, when I talk to, and this includes legal professionals, but it's particularly true in the um, in the corporate sector and in and in government, frankly, although uh, I find that senior public servants are, are, tend to be a little bit more willing to express their lack of knowledge in this area than the private sector. But um, uh, when I when I engage with senior leaders and I ask them what they think about AI and particularly their regular what they understand about their current um, uh, legal obligations, um, I tend to get two um, two answers. One is, oh. Um, we're kind of waiting for guidance from the government. Like that, we, Australia doesn't have an AI regulation, so it's a bit the wild west. We're, you know, we're just trying things, and um, and like I have to come very strongly against that view as as a legal professional myself, but also as someone that that works in policy in this space. There is a wealth of legislation and um, legal obligations that apply. Just it's just tech tech neutral, right? Like it's um, it's outcome based law. Um, and so I, I do run through that list where I say, look, um, if you're a director, uh, section 180 applies, you've got um, positive director's duties here that the courts are going to interpret um, uh, in this space. And those of you who are corporate lawyers may disagree about how that will be interpreted over time. But I, I, I'm I, like, I, I really firmly believe that that will be pulled in under section 180 it already is being discussed very clearly um, and, and extensions from cyber, etc. But then we've also got discrimination law, health and safety law, administrative law, um, we've got tort and negligence, you know, um, there's, there's a whole Thank bunch you. Yeah, there's consumer um, consumer protection law, et cetera. And then that that's only scratches the surface. If, if you're in the healthcare or in financial services, right, you start to go even deeper on these aspects. So really being very clear with the market and with regulated entities about what their obligations, there's a big gap in the awareness there. And the second thing is in terms of internal governments is people say, oh, we're building an ethics statement. And um, and my argument is there is, um, and I think you know probably this, Susanna, is that there's absolutely zero positive impact from um, uh, a, a, between an adoption of ethical principles in an organisation and the, the behaviour of developers and um, groups in procuring and using AI systems. Um, so so no, that's not that doesn't cut it in terms not of enough. obligations. Yeah, yeah, and that's an interesting reflection. If you um, for the I guess the the perception of regulation of a lot of emerging technologies, and we saw this with digital assets and crypto, this kind of statement that, oh, it's unregulated and it's unregulated, whereas actually there were existing laws that did apply in certain circumstances and actually it was just a question of thinking about it through a different lens or actually applying that tech neutrality to understand the harms and the risks and then look from the, from the consumer's perspective. Um, so going back then, just picking up on that, that comment about the ethics point, because the responsible artificial intelligence, responsible AI is certainly something that has gathered a lot more attention in the last couple of years. We had ethics principles and things were all the rage back in 2019. You know, there were different versions of, of the same thing being, being produced and published by lots of different bodies. But certainly responsible AI is, is a term that I'm hearing increasingly. What does that really mean to you at a at both a conceptual but a really practical level how does an inter, how does a business who wants to do the right thing how do they actually live by those standards and, and practice what they preach 
Yeah, look, I, I do think it is, um, there's kind of like maybe four different aspects that we kind of talk about when we talk about responsible AI. And um, uh, it, it does actually start quite um, strategically in terms mm -hmm. of an understanding um, why you would want to use this type of IT or digital system versus any other. And yeah. importantly, what, what your risk tolerance is, um, what your um, types of use cases and their links to potential harms and, and, and risks, um, and then being very clear on at least high level, which areas of law you need to pay more attention to as a result where, where you're going to be brought on under this. And, and it's exactly like you, you mentioned crypto before, but it's exactly those kind of areas which, um, you know, exchanges and other players may have conveniently decided to overlook. Um, and we've seen decisions by ASIC recently about that that, have, um, uh, that are shifting the market. So um, I think that, that, that kind of understanding, particularly for, um, for organizations that are not developers or market, mar you know, they're not actually marketing these, aspect, these, um, these tools, but they're users of it, which is most of most Australians and about 60% of Australian companies are um, really um, deeply embedding AI systems into their um, organizations. We see about 30% of AI use at the moment of, across organizations is in the form of shadow IT. So it's in the form of use, uses by teams and, and, and employees which hasn't gone through any um, IT um, procurement or authorization process. So it's just really off the books. And that could be as yeah. easy as a, as a team just deciding to use Airtable or Trello. And, you know, yeah. um, you know, Trello's a Atlassian product or whatever, you know, it's probably the company's at Atlassian um, customer in other areas, but just using it individually um, to the, or to the, that area of, of, of um, copying and pasting company emails into chat GPT to get a quick answer. Yeah. That kind of well, that's, level. Yeah, yeah. That's so, certainly what we're seeing is that grappling with where you have traditional procurement processes that may be subject to pretty rigorous kind of checks and balances, but you've now got much more of an ability to self-serve. Your employees can self-serve from an organization. Yep. And there's some and again, high profile headlines that you wouldn't want your organization associated with in terms of, yeah. Yeah, and they can self-serve in so many ways. They can self-serve through a company company network, which is where you get picked up if you if you're using it on on a company um, company uh, email or browser. But you can also self-serve a lot from your phone, which might be a personal device as well, in in different ways that can create um, create risk. Um, so so there's that kind of strategic view here. There's a big capability gap, and like I said before, our focus is really on that strategic capability gap. And really importantly, that that's as relevant at the front line, and perhaps even more relevant for frontline um, uh, staff who are using or relying on or or supporting um, customers in using these systems. And it's it's kind of it's no um, it, it was not a coincidence, or and it's certainly not unimportant that with RoboDebt, the um, the first people to notice that something was wrong was the frontline Centrelink staff, um, and. So the, that, that kind of broad-based training of what to look out for um, is, you know, it's a, it's a senior level, you know, senior exec kind of story. It's a gap It's a gap at the operational levels. And we do a lot of training that brings together procurement, legal, compliance, HR, data, um, analytics. And, um, and you know, so that, that broad yeah. term capability there is what you're talking about there, the ability to understand at a at a at an adequate level how this the a that the system is being used b how it's being used and how potentially it could be leading to particular outcomes that may or may not be you know what was intended yeah. 100 percent. and and that 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 there's kind of a yeah i call it i call it minimum viable understanding because you always need to brand yeah. these things susanna but like mvu minimum an acronym let's go with it acronym yeah it's a tla a three-letter mm -hmm. acronym um, but minimum viable understanding is really just don't don't try and become a tech expert. Try and understand what your role requires in meeting that strategic that the strategic intent of the use of AI, and understand then against those legal obligations and um, uh, and concerns about risks what you know what role you need to play. And at the moment, um, most organisations are running even in legal and privacy um, compliance roles. Um, they are choosing to define narrowly what they sign off on, and they are. There's a lot of abdication of responsibility for decision making. It's it's the atomization of responsibility across organisations, particularly happens in the public service at the moment with these decisions. Everyone signs off on their little bit, you know. So the legal team might say, "I've done a privacy review of this AI system, and I can't see any major issues, so pass it on to the next person." Whereas Perhaps it wasn't the privacy review wasn't the most important part of the assessment of that system. 
but the legal team is not set up to do that. They they ha- they don't have that MVU of assessing the system as a whole. And that leads me to my third point, which is really you do need a governance system that is different from IT governance. Um, it, it is there are some special attributes of of AI systems, particularly to do with data. Um, and the decision making, the out, both the input and output that is different from, um, uh, say, just using deciding to use Trello. Um, uh, some of them are exacerbating the same risks, but a lot of the time there are um, kind of qualitative differences that you need to pay attention to there, particularly in how uh, um, when, it, when it faces customers uh, or employees. So recruitment's obviously naturally a big one uh, at the moment. Yeah. Um, and so I'm sure you're you're getting a lot of questions. And I guess the final thing is, um, I don't think we can, and, and this is something that the Banking Royal Commission really harped on about as well, when you're talking about these kind of systemic uses of technology, culture does come into this a lot as well. And so you might have a really good strategy, you've got some decent training, and you've got um, a, a governance system, a process that signs off against um, your AI systems. Um, uh, as we know, there's always golden opportunities to to cheat in those situations. And um, of the three big risks that I look at, I look at system performance failure risks. I look at malicious and misleading use. And I look at overuse. Um, a lot of the times, those um, uh, where that can fall down is in um, in teams where okay, we've got all that, but we're driving for efficiency, not you know looking after the customer. So I'm just going to make these um, slightly. Um, challenging. I'm going to that a little yeah. bit differently. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and that, so that that cultural aspect is a lot more amorphous and hard to uh, encode. But we've seen in health and safety that's what makes a big difference. You need the outside push of prosecutions, and you need um, clear regulation and guidelines that flow through. But at the end of the day, what what is the evidence of what works best in organisations? It's a health and safety culture. That's how you actually get change in your organisation to keep people safe. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think I really like the comment you made around the sort of the narrow focus that certain parts of an organisation can have on an overall system. And when you do have these piecemeal tools being used, you know, the common denominator is the data governance as they flow through, you know, the data flows through those systems, but you can have so many point solutions that may have some component of AI, whether it's you know, officially artificial intelligence or whether it's just a, uh, a a system that's processing information and producing outputs that may or may not be reliable or may or may not have detrimental impacts. Um, you know, business processes are complex at the best of times, but when we start to fragment those systems and and, and lose the overall oversight, I suppose that, that's where we can really see big risks from a, from a systemic perspective. Okay, yeah. so... Um, again, welcome any questions and comments from the audience on concepts around responsible AI. And I think what we're seeing in, in speaking to clients at the moment is there's a, a tension between, you know, an eagerness to, to lean in and use the systems, a nervousness around getting it wrong, and then kind of a lack of clarity or, or direction around the best way to implement the protections and the systems internally. So that's that's really helpful insights. Um and can I just say on that, Susanna, I do see a lot of organizations um, that are pushing to use AI because their competitors are using AI and they don't have a good problem statement or purpose. Yeah. And, and you need a different type of governance for that experimentation. Um, so in terms of if, if, an, if a client is looking to do something with it and keep that safe, you would want to create you know, sandbox environments and safe spaces for employees to satisfy those uh, criteria. And you probably don't want to use a lot of live data um, to do that experimentation. So you create, you want to really make sure that that's safe. If on the other hand, there's a very clear purpose, you know, we're solving a critical business problem or, or we want to incorporate it into a finance function because we can see that there's a vendor that offers this solution that has been plaguing us and we can see the business case there, um, then it's really a different type of structured, well, well, how do we really make sure that we're anticipating the ways that this could be misused or what happens if it does fail, if the system's brittle, if there's a breach. Um, and at the moment, um, uh, organisations tend to be relying literally 100% on vendor assurances and not just vendor assurances, but the assurances of the sales team of the vendor who actually don't have, who have limited information on how that system works themselves. Um, and so that challenge right now is one where um, uh, 
you know, organizations and legal professionals such as yourselves and your firms and, and, the, and the advice that you may be giving is actually really critical. The, the closer to the heart of the business uh, and the greater the risk that those systems, um, those systems represent. Yeah, and that's that's definitely consistent with with what we're hearing. You know, businesses need to absolutely fall in love with the problem that they're trying to solve before they jump in and spend an awful lot of money. And and actually, some of these really big AI models, I hadn't fully appreciated how energy intensive they were. Uh, you know, so it's not necessarily the right solution to go and whack a massive large language model on the front end of your website um, and then burn through a whole lot of energy. Uh, or, or you know so there's there's lots of different components to this that that need to be considered uh we've had a question through you may or may not be able to answer this one but we've heard in other sessions that some ai tools eg chat gpt contain some of their own safety mechanisms so it will refuse to generate some things which it understands to be obvious intellectual property infringements are you aware whether there are similar safeguards in relation to other rights, particularly human rights? And do you have any other concerns about this? Uh, yeah, it's, look, it's a really interesting um, question. It's also a really interesting tension at the moment because yeah. if you um, if you take um, if you take the example that, the, that I said before that a lot of these generative AI models like facial recognition, they can be used in lots of different contexts, right? They're very, they're inherently flexible. And so you have to go down to what's that actual use case in order to think about how you might um, uh, respond in, in a kind of regulatory sense. It's very hard to just ban or regulate the, the maps. Um, but then when we go down to that level, you realize that you've taken a model, um, you know, a, a really capable model like GPT-4 from OpenAI, you might have taken that um, through um, uh, through a vendor, through Microsoft, et cetera. Um, and then you realize that um, just like you point out, um, Angus, in order to use that, the, the system needs to be fine-tuned or pre-trained to pull out some of this dangerous material. Um, and, and so you've kind of like, well, on the one hand, I want to be really focused on the obligations in my use case. But on the other hand, I have to go quite far upstream to set some of those protections and anticipate that in the first place. So there's a little bit of a tension there and as a result, um, these tools have been fine-tuned for some very kind of obvious high-level um, aspects, but certainly not um, all rights, right? Human rights is a broad set of rights. Um, so what I, I'm particularly concerned here um, about privacy-related rights, and um, the, the system can be induced to pull out its training data without too much trouble if you've got unfettered access to it. Um, that is something that's very hard to protect, and that's different from the fine, fine tuning that you put all over the model or the um, the human reinforcement um, reinforcement learning by um, human feedback approach, which gets rid of swear words or references to pedophilia or um, extreme um, uh, extreme language and um, and violent extremism references, etc. Um, so, so there's a limit to how much how much how well that can be done. And then there's a second problem um, in that privacy space, which is the, the direction we're going with generative AI is that an organization will um, buy in um, a core model and do fine chaining on their own system and data. Um, and then you're not just worried about the general model data coming out, you're moderate, you're worried about your own system data. And so the, the amount of access you give to the external world becomes far more, um, far more important. Um, I haven't seen, apart from speech-based, um, like bias and discriminatory language, et cetera, I haven't seen many other safeguards beyond safeguarding, uh, trying to safeguard um, the, the privacy of data, which hasn't worked out so well uh, um, before. But yeah, giving, you know, um, misinformation and the bigger, like dispersed risks in society um, no one's really um, figured out a way to approach that as a safety mechanism yet. But I know that um, the eSafety Commissioner, um, Julie Inman Grant, is, is having consultations with, there's a consultation on this next week. Yeah, yeah. And it's, look, it's a great, it's a great question. Every time we see this sort of step change in use and adoption of emerging technology, we necessarily shine a light on all the problems with it. And then we need to wait for the tech to catch up to solve for some of those problems. And maybe they can, and maybe they can't. And um, obviously takes, takes clever people to, to throw themselves behind that. So um, let's let's move on now to, I guess, just the state of AI regulation. Like where would you say, so we don't have a particular AI act in, in Australia. We've talked about that. We've definitely seen 
um, around the world a divergence of approaches. We've got China that's going for really specific use cases around sort of um, deep fakes or, or synthesis technology, plus their recommendation algorithms and the like. How would you describe the, the current state of play in Australia? Kind of where are we now? Where have we come from? And then we might look at where we're going. Yeah, so I think the current state of play is that we have um, these cross-cutting um, obligations that relate to AI design, development and use. And the kind of seven that we talk about is, you know, the, your director's duties, which are obviously quite specific in Corporations Act applying to um, uh, company directors. And then you have cyber um, security provisions, consumer protection, anti-discrimination, got duty of care, general negligence duties, um, uh, work, health and safety and privacy. Um, so they're kind of like those seven categories are the ones where we say that actually that's that's where we tend to point um, across industries, right? So not looking deeply into one particular regulated market. That's when we say like that's the current state at the moment is we're really reliant on those. Um, but regulators have not been enforcing or looking at those aspects until quite recently. Um, not only have they not been looking, as you all very keenly aware, they're not well resourced to be able to do a lot of enforcement um, action, haven't, haven't been. Um, we'll see where that goes um, uh, in the future. So that's the current, like literally the today snapshot in a nutshell, and I'm happy to um, dive into anything. And, and by the way, I should kind of mention, as you did at the beginning, Susanna, um, we have two big projects at the moment running from which I'm drawing the data and inferences from this. One is um, called the um, uh, called AI Corporate Governance Program. That's a three-year program looking specifically at the corporate governance of AI systems. And then we've got the Future of AI Regulation Project, which is a um, it's actually a, a really a legal analysis of the gaps, emerging gaps in um, uh, in regulation in Australia. And we've kind of finished the first phase of that, which is well, where do we sit today? Um, yeah. In terms of how organisations are internalising that um, in Australia and around the world, um, they're not. So that we haven't seen any change on um, recent, like in the last three years around the world, but also in Australia on how companies are dealing with it. They, they're still taking cyber about as serious as they, as they were before, but not really picking up any specific um, aspects of this related to AI. Um, and then if you look around the world, um, there is this quite steep curve um, going up to 2019 of AI policy instruments around the world. I think we picked at about 300 policy instruments published in, yeah. in 2019. Um, and that stalled because of the EU's AI Act. Um, and everyone's waiting, uh, not everyone, a lot of a lot of jurisdictions are waiting to say, oh, we want to kind of understand how, um, how that's turning out before we um, announce our own initiatives. Um, probably the one exception is China, China has an amazing array of really thoughtful and nuanced policy on AI. Um, in fact, if you want to look at a really interesting and thoughtful AI um, policy proposal for generative AI, um, China is currently doing, Chinese government is currently doing consultation on that. So I think you have until the end of the month to put in your views to the um, Chinese government, if that's, if that's your gig. Um, but um, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, obviously, but um, uh, we're, we're seeing essentially um, a, a steady linear increase in enacted legislation around the world specific to AI. And we're also seeing a number of um, jurisdictions plugging the gaps in the way that I hope Australia will with the Privacy Act um, reform. Yeah, yeah. so there's, there's all of those sort of concurrent reforms going on. And then obviously just this week, we've had the, the Senate hearing in the US where we've got large incumbents calling for regulation, which is terribly convenient, seeing the kind of hit scale. And there may be a cynic there saying that there's a benefit to them in now being regulated to keep the competition up. Um, but let's wait and see how that goes. Is there a, you know, in the same way that GDPR kind of set that, that global standard for privacy, is, is there a, a sense... Um, certainly some people that I've been speaking to feel there's a sense that if the EU AI Act does kind of set a benchmark, it'll be quite um, influential for companies that are operating cross-border on a global scale uh, in the same way that a lot of companies do elect to comply with GDPR across the board, even though domestic standards in their privacy legislations may be a, a slightly lower bar. Do you, do you have a sense of, of what what that sort of the impact of the the EU AI Act might be? Yeah, look, for I think those really high risk areas that the EU talks that the EU Act talks about, I think they will be quite affected by this. Mm. Um, and um, 
yeah so like for for example we already see like quite a big um regulatory market failure um it's a, it's a bit of a maybe it's not a regulatory market failure but there's a type of market failure whereby um when when you tell when you tell the big vendors they just can't do something um they do pull out right like we do see um in facial recognition meta microsoft completely deprecated their facial recognition services as of 30 30th of um june this year microsoft will no longer offer its um face api services to um customers unless um they've got a research um exemption um which by the way we're going for because we use it for training um mm -hmm. But uh, what happens is um, bad actors fill the void. Um, so less responsible companies with, with poorer governance just come in. And so what we're, what we're likely to see in terms of an interesting regulatory impact is you, probably those big players will say, okay, we'll, we'll, we won't, if we can't serve um, Europe, we're, we're not going to start saying, oh, we'll serve in the US you know, law enforcement for this type of system, but we won't serve in Europe. We'll try and be a little bit consistent because, you know, it's still a big market and maybe public sentiment and others will, will push them out. Um, but there'll be an influx of, um, of other players that just don't care. Um, so I think the Brussels effect will happen to a certain extent on those highly regulated, high risk end of, um, of the, the, the market, um, particularly when those are served through open online platforms because if they're a cloud service that's open to everyone, you then have that problem of having to block um, in Europe. And, and that's yeah. that's another um, uh, aspect in there. Um, the other thing that I do think will be kind of um, affected will be the transparency requirements. I think that will generally um, bring a shift in terms of how organizations start to be more open about where and when they're using AI systems. Because if you yeah. have to explain it to all European customers, it's not that much of a big deal to also do that same explanation and you will see a shift in terms of um expectation um in other ways obviously yeah. the, the, the other the, the third channel i'll say is that the harmonized standards on which the eu ai yes. act relies will be a massive channel for internationalization but they don't exist yet um and mm -hmm. i sit on the iso um sc42 committee on ai standards and we're very much hoping that whatever those harmonized standards end up looking like they will be pretty close to what the IEEE and what ISO has been working on for the last couple of years, because otherwise that's a real dog's breakfast. Yeah, absolutely. And so for, for others on the call, the way the the, um, the EU AI Act is going to, it'll sort of delegate compliance quite heavily to those standards, which is, um, I guess, makes perfect sense in one respect, because you've got people who really understand the technology who are contributing to those standards. Um, but at the same time, you, we need to make sure that the right people are on those <laughs> standards committees to make sure that they're um, doing doing the task at hand. And probably just Susanna, the biggest concern I have on those standards committees is that traditionally they really underrepresent civil society um, and they overrepresent a small number of of um, actually a very small number of tech firms who actually fund their, yeah. their staff to join in that. So um, I would love to see some uh, in Australia in particular if we're going to go down the standards route that we should be supporting um, civil society and community engagement with that standard making process, which we're currently not. Yeah, really important piece of the overall picture. Um, conscious of time, let's let's jump ahead a little bit. And I, to the extent that you've got any findings from your project on the future of AI regulation, we'd love to hear your predictions. Um, I'm also really interested in this, obviously, Law, Law Council committee members are going to be asked to comment on policy and law reform through their various committees on particular pieces of legislation that may not overtly um, you know, be, be AI focused, but may have an AI lens. So I'm really interested in sort of where you think we're going um, and what, what should committee members be mindful of throughout these processes as they're looking at um, consultations that we do frequently um, you know, what, what should we be paying attention to and where do you think we're going? I think it's I think it's reasonable to assume that the um that a, a really good signal will, will be the final list of um high risk or um uh, um 
you know, basically just banned unacceptable, uh, unacceptable, unacceptable risk, unacceptable risk yeah. technologies or use cases. So that's real-time biometric systems, particularly in public um, contexts. It's predictive policing systems. Um, it's biometric categorization on sensitive characteristics. It's um, scraping of data from social media for these systems. It's face analysis, emotional recognition systems. And just to be clear, all of these systems are used in Australia today. Right, every single one of those is used in varying extents today, and um, and so these are not future risks or um, you know like theoretical problems. Um, New South Wales um, Police has been using predictive um, uh, policing systems um, for for about a decade now. So um, uh, that list will be important because of that effect on the market and the pressure that it will put on um, public sector and private sector organisations not to deploy them because of that standard. Um, uh, I think in Australia, probably my biggest concern in terms of looking at where we're going to go um, is I think there's still a fairly good chance that we will be developing our own AI regulation system and that it won't be um, incredibly simpatico with other jurisdictions. Um, and and I'm, I'm, the reason I'm not encouraged in that area is just a series of conversations I've had with DESA and like other government departments and policymakers, um, where uh, there, there just hasn't been that engagement with international the international community yet uh, to the level that I would hope um, mm -hmm. was present. And and so yeah, while Australia is enthusiastically part of the standards organisation processes, and we 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 punch above our weight and set with Standards Australia compared to other jurisdictions, like um, I. I I lead a task team in impact assessment for the 42,005 standard. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really at the forefront globally up there with Germany and Japan and the US in terms of shaping these standards. Um, but at the same time, they have to be enacted into legislation or called upon. And I'm just worried that the international harmonization or, or even not harmonization, interoperational oper aspects of it. And that's a key thing, I think, for the Law Council to continue to bang on about because just it's just, it's going to be just tough if we if it goes the same way as we have with other legislation in Australia, where we went it alone and um, ended up in um, a bit of a just a bit of a more of a tough situation. Um, it's particularly important for Australian small businesses um, running software overseas. So I think making sure that that's um, that's one thing that we need to go. I think the second thing is I'm, I've been really disencouraged by recent moves in the media about the privacy reform. Uh, process and um, I was I had big hopes about six months ago that that would be or four months ago even that that would be the Privacy Act reform would be a basis for a huge amount of rights-based protection and support for then subsequent interpretations or, or um, uh, regulation that would really um, be, be yeah nuanced and thoughtful and, and more risk-based in that kind of sliding scale aspect. Um, uh, I would really think that I'd think something like that privacy um, law reform. I know the government, I know that Mark Dreyfus's office have, and the Attorney General has got a huge stack of, you know, seven other things in front of it to get through. But in terms of making sure that Australians um, get the best out of where we sit as AI evolves, having a really up-to-date Strong Privacy Act is absolutely critical and foundational. And if, if, if the Attorney General's office needs more support, in terms of phasing it, in terms of thinking through it, in terms of whatever, like my sense is, how can we find ways to help that, to help the AGD, to help the department and the office get their head around this so that it doesn't sit for the next two years waiting as foundational kind of ref, um, law reform? And then the third thing is I it's do think- It's part of the digital economy. It's so important to get that so, right. And we are, we are literally two decades out of date on privacy law yeah. in Australia, and it's it's just a bit tragic. It just It's going to hold us back in lots of different ways. And then finally, there's some opportunities for some really targeted kind of vertical legislation that just goes after some of these issues where we go well actually no we don't want remote biometrics used in public let's just let's let's tackle facial recognition as we've said let's tackle a couple of these things even if we can't through the privacy act reform process let's go to just protect australians and 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 i keep on saying this to everyone we spoke to good regulation and good governance is incredibly freeing like it's in, it creates this like open space to be able to do stuff where you're not constantly checking yourself and worried and um, and that's where we want to be. Yeah, that's really interesting. And with so there are certain jurisdictions. So India and and you know the UK is trying to do everything that Europe's not. So it's kind of adopting a pro innovation approach and and trying to sort of foster that. <laughs> um, 
But India's come out and said, you know, we're not going to, we're going to just let it run wild and, and hopefully catch up to some other jurisdictions. And then in time, we'll look at, to see whether or not we think we need regulation. What's the real risk? You know, there's always the, the, you know, the genies out of the bottle with AI because people go to this dystopian future of artificial general intelligence instead of some of these more discrete defined use cases of AI. Is that a real risk for international sort of harmonization and concepts if you've got some jurisdictions where there's just unbounded innovation and use of these systems and, and development? How do we reconcile that? Unfortunately, everything we know from other areas of technology development is it 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 depends like all of that really just depends on um, essentially the scientific community coming to a consensus yeah. on that research, and it doesn't really depend much on uh, government regulation. So, as as an example, um, uh, there is an there there has been like a um, international laws and a moratorium on on um, chimera, so human animal hybrids through genetic technology, right? So mixing human DNA with animal DNA to create what they call technical term is chimera. Um, there is a absolute the academies of science around the world all say we don't do that, and in fact there's UK there's UK law, there's Australian law, you know, it's Chinese law regulating that you can't do that, um, and and so there's been this sense that, okay, we got that covered. But the UK did an audit um, about five years ago on the use of um, gene, uh, gene, gene technologies and found five labs in the UK that were doing chimera studies, right? So right. even though culturally and like on the level of the Academy of Sciences, everyone agrees we're not doing research on that area. Um, and, and the reason that came out was there was an accusation made against China and, and China was saying, no, we're like, we, we're, we, we promise we don't have you know whether you believe them or not but when they then the uk did the audit they were the problem mm -hmm. like you know so um so it's going to happen right this kind of yeah. um, and it's not all like the tv show sweet tooth i don't know if yeah. anyone else has seen that but <laughs> the other thing that the the, the the one of the the best suggestions i've seen on regulating it um regulating large language models at the moment has been just on regulating computation so you can't really um you can't really say to people um uh, you know, well, it's it's hard to say to people just don't do it, please. You know, don't do it because if you can just if you can just do it, you do it. But at the moment, um, you do require quite a lot of computation to do the initial training of large language models. And so, um, uh, Tiberio uh, Catano has come out from the Gradient Institute saying, well, um, you know, AWS and and Microsoft and the other big cloud um, providers should be monitoring for spikes in massive amounts of GPU use because then you could pick up when someone's um, uh, training a model. Um, I mean, AWS already does checks. If you start using a, a huge amount of computation, they will call you up and say, "What are you doing?" Because it's they need to know for load balancing purposes. Um, and indeed, yeah. one of the one of the big um, uh, team Emirates New Zealand, when they were designing their um, their boat, they had to like explain what they were doing um, using the AWS services because that was so computationally intensive to design that award that um, uh, award winning boat. But um, yeah, is it realistic that governments around the world would do that monitoring and uh, would, would put that duty? I don't think so. So no, yeah. it comes back to do we have to have concepts of, um, you know, in the same way that certain professions have standards and principles to be licensed and are there, are there new professions that have such a transformative role in whether it's data scientists or computer programmers, you know, do they play such an important role going forward that actually they, as a profession, need to have some kind of standards boards? And but then, how do you enforce that? And you know, anyway, that's a whole yeah. other kind of worms. And maybe I'll just say on that, um, we we do um, when when a lot of people talk about the ethics space, they say we need a Hippocratic oath for data scientists. And I always point out that the Hippocratic oath may be ancient, but it's not the thing that regulates how doctors behave. What regulates how doctors behave, and we know is insurance, medical malpractice suits, and um, social opprobrium. Um, and and that it's, the Hippocratic Oath is a nice expression of that, but it's not the causal factor. And so we do need to be pretty creative um, on those things. I have to say, Susanna, I'm less worried about that existential risk question at the moment because I can see so many harms being perpetrated and, and, and um, absorbed by vulnerable people in vulnerable communities. Um, I just think we need to really also focus on that, um, what's happening now. Yeah, definitely. Um, look, we're almost at time. I don't know if anybody has a final question or two in the last few minutes. 
Uh, I'll give everyone a minute to put those in the chat. But look, as we as we wrap up, though, thank you so much for your time, Nick Davis. That was amazing to hear your insights. Obviously, this is something you've been looking at for a long time. Um, very happy and comforted to know that you guys are doing the good work that you're doing. Um, and obviously, for those who are on various committees of the Law Council, please do connect and follow and, and keep abreast of, of all the great work that's going on. Uh, no doubt this will be uh, the first of several conversations and, and look forward to kind of making sure that we can make the, the impact from, from where we sit here in the Law Council. So. And I know that, um, yeah, no, just from me, I know that Ed Santo would love to come back to um, the Law Council as he um, and Sophie Farthing in our uh, office um, spin up and, and further develop that future of AI regulation report. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. And so, yeah, so we'll make sure that we reach out through you and the um, the committee, Susanna, but also um, generally like really grateful for all the work that of um, the Law Council's doing in terms of submissions and, and consultations and other work on this area, because we are we at a really important time. The laws are literally being written right now, so it is incumbent on all incumbent on all of us to really make that happen and work well today. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much. And these sessions for those on the call, these sessions will be recorded and they'll be shared fairly widely. So I encourage you to uh, make sure that others on the committees have have had a chance to catch up because it's an important, super important area for us to be across. So thanks again for your time, um, and we'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you.